Ever since the Civil War's opening shots were fired at the Battle of Fort Sumter, President Lincoln and his administration have designated Charleston, South Carolina as a top priority target for the Union War effort. Not only is it symbolic for being the site of the war's opening shots, Charleston is also one of the main hotbeds of secessionist fervor in the Deep South. It was here that the first Ordinance of Secession was passed on December 20th, 1860, and its symbolic significance is not lost on either side. However, most importantly in the eyes of the Union Navy, Charleston is a major port city on the Atlantic seaboard, allowing for the continued trade of cotton and other goods between the Confederacy and Europe the Port of Charleston also provides a stopping point for Confederate blockade runners and their passage across the Atlantic. In order to effectively strangle the Confederate economy as part of General-in-Chief Winfield Scott's Anaconda Plan, Charleston would need to be closed off. In order to do this, the Union Navy would have to cooperate closely with the Army. The Confederates equally recognized the importance of Charleston for its symbolic military and economic reasons. As such, on November 5, 1861, the Confederate War Department forms the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida and places it under the command of General Robert E. Lee, whose lackluster performance against Union forces in the Western Virginia Campaign has relegated him to this seemingly quiet front, overseeing the construction of defenses and fortifications on the Atlantic coastline from South Carolina to Florida. On November 7, 1861, the Union Navy's South Atlantic Blockading Squadron commanded by Flag Officer Samuel F. DuPont, overpowers two Confederate forts at the mouth of Port Royal Sound in one of the first amphibious operations of the war. Flag Officer DuPont's victory at the Battle of Port Royal enables Brigadier General Thomas W. Sherman, of no relation to William Tecumseh Sherman, to land a 12,000-man Federal invasion force and take control of Hilton Head Island between the Confederacy's two foremost Atlantic ports, Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. The capture of Port Royal Sound, one of the best deep water harbors south of New York City, would enable the Union Navy's South Atlantic Blockading Squadron to effectively operate its blockading operations against both Charleston and Savannah, using Port Royal as a supply base strategically positioned in between the two key southern cities. On March 15, 1862, the U.S. War Department issues General Orders No. 26, announcing the creation of the Union Army Department of the South commanded by Major General David Hunter. After establishing his headquarters on Hilton Head Island, Hunter places Brigadier General Henry Washington Benham in charge of the northern district of this new department on March 21st. Three weeks later, under the direction of Captain Quincy A. Gilmore, Union forces used long-range rifled artillery to capture Fort Pulaski and practically close off the port of Savannah. Hunter would now be able to turn his attention to Charleston. With a large federal force on Hilton Head and Port Royal Sound, and with the reconnaissance parties going out farther and farther, work on the inner defenses of Charleston is continuing at an accelerated rate. Suddenly, on March 2, 1862, General Lee, who's in Savannah at the time, receives the following telegram from President Davis. If circumstances will, in your judgment, warrant your leaving, I wish to see you here with the least delay. The following day, Lee departs Savannah for Richmond never to return to his former command. General Lee's successors, Major General John C. Pemberton, who had been assigned as a Brigadier General to Lee's command and had been recently promoted. The day after Lee's departure, Pemberton assumes command of the department and sets up his headquarters at Pocotaligo Station, South Carolina, on the Charleston and Savannah Line, along with Brigadier General Nathan G. Shanks Evans, a hard-drinking yet capable commander who has proven himself a scourge of the Yankees at Manassas and Ball's Bluff. Pemberton has been assigned to General Lee's command directly by President Davis. Just before leaving for Richmond, General Lee writes to Major General Pemberton that before the Yankees would attack either Charleston or Savannah, they would attempt to seize the line of the railroad both east and west of the waters of the Broad River, so as to isolate your force. General Lee also writes to Governor Joseph E. Brown of Georgia that the only way to get troops to Charleston is by the Augusta and Savannah Railroad to Augusta, Georgia, and from there by the South Carolina Railroad to Charleston. This is a long circuitous route in a time of an emergency. Shortly after taking command of the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, Major General Pemberton writes to South Carolina Attorney General Isaac W. Hayne in Charleston 
telling him that he has examined the defenses on James Island and had directed Brigadier General Roswell S. Ripley, commander of the 2nd Military District of South Carolina, to build up works there, but had been informed that Ripley did not have the necessary labor. Pemberton goes on to ask Hayne for his cooperation, or, if necessary, that of the executive and council to enforce the supply of labor which General Ripley may require. Lack of sufficient labor is a major problem in completing the defenses on James Island. Pemberton also requests that a connection be made in Charleston between the Charleston and Savannah Railroad and the South Carolina Railroad as a military necessity. The terminus of the former is on the south side of the Ashley River and there is no bridge to the city. At the end of March 1862, Major General Pemberton orders Colonel Arthur M. Manigault, commander of the 1st Military District of South Carolina, which includes Georgetown to the north of Charleston, to dismantle his batteries and abandon his position. The work is to be done at night, and heavy logs are to be placed in position as each gun is dismounted. The heaviest guns are to be removed first, and all are to be shipped to Charleston. When the work is completed, Colonel Manigault is to report with his troops to Ripley in Charleston. On March 27th, Pemberton issues an order to Ripley, which has far-reaching results, to withdraw the guns from the batteries on Coles Island. These guns control the entrance of the Stono River. If the Union Navy gunboats could ascend the river, the results could be extremely serious for the overall defenses of Charleston. When Governor Francis W. Pickens hears the news of the impending move, he immediately wires General Lee in Richmond that if Coles Island is abandoned before the inner lines are prepared, it opens their approach to the city to the enemy. General Lee replies diplomatically that such a move can only be decided by the officer in command of the department, but Lee does recommend to Pemberton that he comply with Governor Pickens' suggestions. Lee, who has experience dealing with Pickens, essentially tells Pemberton that he should be more diplomatic with the South Carolina officials. While the Confederates are busy building up their defenses around Charleston and its outskirts during the spring months of 1862, an event transpires in Charleston Harbor on May 13th that will provide Major General David Hunter with a clear opportunity to quickly capture the city before the rebel defensive works can be completed. A Confederate shallow draft and armed coastal steamer named the Planner serves as a military transport in the Charleston Harbor area. The ship is manned by a white captain, mate, an engineer, and five enslaved crewmen. One of the crewmen is a knowledgeable pilot named Robert Smalls. On May 12, 1862, the ship picks up four cannons from Coles Island, part of the Confederate southern flank defenses of Charleston near the Stono River Inlet, and returns to a berth in the harbor where 200 pounds of ammunition are loaded. Leaving the five crewmen aboard and contrary to orders, the white captain and crew then go ashore to spend the night. Around 3 a.m. the next morning, May 13th, Robert Smalls and his crews fire the boilers, raise the Confederate and Palmetto flags, blow the whistle to give the appearance of a routine, pick up his wife and other women and children located nearby, and steam towards the harbor entrance. Donning the captain's straw hat and giving the appropriate signals as Confederate positions are passed, with the last being Fort Sumter, Small guides the planter out of the Charleston Harbor and heads to the Union blockade fleet, lowering the flags and raising a white bedsheet. Small surrenders to the USS Onward. The planter is sent with her crew to Port Royal to report directly to Flag Officer DuPont. The intelligence provided by Smalls includes heretofore unknown details of Charleston's defenses. Of the greatest importance is that of the 25,000 troops thought to be defending Charleston, all but a few thousand have been shipped to Virginia and Tennessee. Secondly, the positions and batteries defending the Stono Inlet in the southern flank on Coles Island have been abandoned. It is as if Major General Hunter and Flag Officer DuPont had been handed the key to Charleston's back door. With this intelligence in hand, efforts accelerate to launch the expedition against Charleston. The withdrawal of Confederate troops from the string of coastal islands to the south of James Island allows Union forces to easily overrun them. The abandonment of Coles Island by Pemberton gives Union gunboats access to the Stono River and the ability to bring naval guns to bear on the southwestern shores of James Island.
Later in May, Brigadier General States Rights Gist, the overall commander of the Confederate forces on James Island, pulls most of Colonel Clement H. Stevens' 24 South Carolina off Coles Island and relocates them near to Secessionville. In May 20th, the Union Navy begins a constant reconnaissance of James Island, including sending probes up the Stono River. Having ascertained closely guarded personnel and ordnance deployment information from Robert Smalls, what should have been a clear-cut attack by Federal forces under Henry Benham becomes contentious. A confluence of miscommunication and posturing includes several disagreements with Flag Officer DuPont exacerbates this. In an obvious effort to squelch Benham, DuPont directs his correspondence to Major General Hunter and spares no one in his sharp denunciation of Benham's ways and means. This is but the first misstep that derails plans for a quick and easy defeat at the cradle of secession. As preparations are being made for the Union assault on James Island, faulty intelligence leads them to believe that the Confederacy has an overstrength group in excess of 12,000 soldiers available for the island's defense. This is pantingly untrue. This bad intel comes either from Confederate prisoners or deserters, who exaggerate their side's numbers. In actuality, Pemberton writes to Governor Pickens as late as June 15th that he has on James Island only 6,500 effective men. Throughout the campaign against Charleston, Union intelligence consistently overestimates the numbers of available Confederate troops. The situation is critical. Stono Inlet is filled with transports and gunboats, but even now, although he has told President Davis, who has requested that Pemberton transfer parts of his command to the Gathering Army in Virginia, they could spare no troops. Pemberton receives a similar request from George W. Randolph, Secretary of War. On a rainy June 2nd, Union troops land on the southwesternmost tip of James Island at the plantation of Thomas Grimble. The Confederates put up little resistance to the Union landing. But as the Federals begin to move up the shore, they are met by heavy fire. A skirmish takes place, but the landing is made and the troops are ashore. Colonel Johnson Haggard, commanding the 1st South Carolina Infantry Regiment, comes under heavy fire from the Union gunboats and later comments that he was subjected to a rapid fire of gunboat shells, which threatened as much damage from the fallen limbs cut from the trees as from themselves. He and his men are in a densely wooded area with 11-inch shells bursting all around them. The advance guard of the Union forces from the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, the 47th New York, 45th Pennsylvania, and 97th Pennsylvania pushes ahead for about a mile. Some in order to get out of the rain, take shelter in sheds and corn cribs. Many of them soon learn to prefer the rain to the dry but flea-infested shelter. Over the next few days, troops from both the transports as well as those who had come across John's Island are landed on James Island. Realizing that the main attack might be directed against their breastwork at Secessionville, General Pemberton instructs Brigadier General William D. Smith to hold at any cost the west woods of Secessionville. Pemberton knows that Union forces are going to make an all-out attempt to capture Charleston, and he is making every effort to meet the attack wherever it may come. On June 10th, Pemberton orders the Confederate lines to advance in order to establish a battery of heavy guns on the edge of Grimble's plantation with a view to driving the Federal gunboats from the immediate area and making landing hazardous. Colonel Haggard starts advancing with the 1st South Carolina, the 4th Louisiana Battalion on the right flank and Colonel Gilbert W. M. Williams with the 47th Georgia on the left flank. Williams runs into the Union forces in the thick woods. According to Williams, the Georgians make a gallant advance and fought with great vigor, but their lines being disorganized, advance in squad strength where they were repulsed and badly cut up. Again, the indirect fire of the Union gunboats play an important part in the repulse of the Confederates. During the next few days, Union forces are busily unloading supplies and troops. The Confederate forces are working to strengthen their lines and secure additional ammunition. On June 14th, Brigadier General Shanks Evans assumes command on James Island and spends the next two days inspecting the lines. He knows an attack is coming, but he does not know at precisely what point to expect it. He decides, however, to fortify one of the larger breastworks which lay across a small peninsula on either side of which is a marsh. The peninsula at this particular point is approximately 125 yards wide. Just beyond it is the cluster of summer homes known as Secessionville. In spite of feverish activity, this breastwork, known as Fort Lamar after its commander, Colonel Thomas G. Lamar of the 1st South Carolina Artillery Regiment, 
is incomplete at the time of the impending Union attack. Colonel Lamar has pushed his men to the point of exhaustion to complete the fortification. Finally, at 5 a.m. on the morning of June 16th, he allows his worn out men to sleep. This is the only time they had been permitted to do so without arms in their hands, and is almost disastrous. They are barely asleep when they are awakened by an assault by a brigade of Union troops in the pre-dawn darkness. The Battle of Secessionville has begun. By 2 a.m. on June 16, 1862, the Federal troops had been fallen in in two columns. The first of assaulting groups consists of Brigadier General Isaac I. Stevens' 2nd Division of Benham's Northern District, composed of six regiments with some engineers, cavalry, and artillery. This group is comprised of about 3,500 men. Another column, comprised of the 1st Division under Brigadier General Horatio G. Wright, consists of around 3,100 troops who is formed on the left side of the 2nd Division. The assaulting group is to advance in silence and make the attack on Fort Lamar at first light with the bayonet. The 1st Division is to protect the 2nd from a flank attack by the Confederates. It is believed that the large number of Federal troops should be more than enough to surprise and crush a garrison of 500 men. At 4 a.m., the movement gets underway. The attacking column is led by Lt. Benjamin Lyons, Stevens' aide-de-camp, who is accompanied by a local black guide. The morning is dark and cloudy, and it is difficult for the officers to align the troops. About three quarters of a mile from the Battery of Fort Lamar, the attacking force runs into Confederate pickets of the 1st South Carolina, who fire at them and wound five men of the 8th Michigan. All four pickets are captured. Their firing should have alarmed the garrison, but apparently little attention is paid to the gunshots. The leading Federal troops of the 1st Brigade under Colonel Fenton Graves consist of two companies of the 8th Michigan and some New York engineers, closely followed by the rest of the 8th, the 7th Connecticut, and the 28th Massachusetts. The 8th Michigan advances in regimental front, with the other two regiments close in on its hills. The 2nd Brigade, led by Colonel Daniel Leisure and consisting of the Scottish-American Highlanders of the 79th New York, the Roundheads of the 100th Pennsylvania, in the 46th New York, are held in close reserve. All are excellent regiments. The 8th Michigan and 79th New York are the crack regiments of the entire force. The Federals advance across the cotton field in good order until they are met by a blast of canister from the battery's 10-inch Columbia fired by Colonel Lamar. This blows a gap in the advancing line, but they continue on. Soon, they're receiving a devastating fire from the thoroughly awakened garrison. In spite of the fire grape, canister, chains, nails, and broken glass. Some of the 8th Michigan manages to climb onto the parapet, where they fight hand-to-hand -hand with the Confederate defenders. The narrowing of the peninsula at the point at which Fort Lamar stands makes it difficult for the supporting regiments to maneuver. The fire cuts the regiments in half. The Irishman of the 28th Massachusetts takes cover in the bushes next to the marsh, and they fire steadily on the defenders. Some of the 7th Connecticut takes cover to the right and in the Cotton Rose. The remnants of the 8th Michigan who have gained the parapet are left unsupported. Confederate troops rush to the aid of Colonel Lamar's defenders as they are awakened. The first to reach him is the 9th South Carolina Battalion under the command of Colonel Alexander D. Smith. Next, from its encampment nearby comes the 1st South Carolina Infantry Battalion, nicknamed the Charleston Battalion, under Lt. Col. Peter C. Gaylord. Finally, those of the assaulting troops had reached the parapet are either killed or repulsed. The 8th Michigan falls back and reforms, and with the aid of the 2nd Brigade, they charge under fire for 1,000 yards, assault the works, and again gain a foothold on the parapet. After more fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they are again pushed back. In the meantime, the 3rd New Hampshire and some of the troops of the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery have marched down the other peninsula, which is separated only by a small creek from the peninsula on which Fort Lamar is located. Taking cover in some heavy undergrowth on the edge of the creek, they fire from the rear at the gunners of the battery, forcing them to leave their guns and take up the rifles. Some of the Charleston battalion are sent to meet their threat. Meanwhile, the situation on the parapet is precarious, as reinforcements are slowly coming to the beleaguered rebel garrison. 
Two things helped turn the tide of the battery's favor. Lieutenant Colonel J. McHenry, commanding the 4th Louisiana Battalion, had been awakened by Colonel Haggard and sent to Secessionville. McHenry and his men, who are encamped some distance away, start toward the battery. But as they are unfamiliar with the country, they become confused when they arrive at a crossroads. This delays them for a few moments. Once on the right road, they advance to Secessionville over the bridge, nearly a mile long, that extends from the opposite part of the island to the rear of the battery. They arrive on the run yelling, Remember Butler! An allusion to General Benjamin Butler's recent occupation of their home city of New Orleans. They give considerable assistance in repulsing the 3rd New Hampshire, pouring a deadly volley fire into the rear of the battery. Another factor that turns the tide of the battle are two small field guns situated at two different locations. One manned by Lieutenant Jetter, the other by Lieutenant Colonel Elson Capers. Both men fire their guns with excellent effect on the 3rd New Hampshire and help hasten the withdrawal. Meanwhile, hand-to-hand -hand fighting continues until the assaulting troops are again repulsed. A two-gun battery 24-pounder howitzers is placed in front of E.M. Clark's house, later known as Battery Reed, for the purpose of inflating an enemy attack on the breastwork at Secessionville a mile away. At the time of the attack, Lt. Col. Elson Capers, laying our Episcopal Bishop, is with Col. Haggard. When Haggard is unable to hear the battery open fire, he orders Col. Capers to find out the trouble. When Capers arrives there, he finds Lt. Col. J.B. Kitching and about 15 men belonging to Col. Lamar's regiment. Capers wants to know why the battery has not fired. Kitchen informs him that he and his men have just returned from the country, having no orders and knows nothing about loading and firing a cannon. However, he says that he would gladly cooperate if Capers would instruct them. Capers loads and fires one of the guns. The shell hits in the area right behind G.W. Hill's house which is currently occupied at the moment by a federal regiment. Kitchen and his men are soon loading and firing like veteran artillerymen. One gun recoils off his carriage, but the other is fired throughout the battle. One shot kills a captain and a sergeant of the 3rd New Hampshire. A few days later, Capers receives a note from Brigadier General Smith commending him for his efficient and distinguished service, and Lt. Col. Kitchen, the substitute artilleryman, is cited by Lamar for gallant conduct. Having such an excellent support from naval gunfire at the landing at James Island, Brigadier General Benham decides to use it again in his assault against Secessionville. The gunboats USS Ellen and E.B. Hale, both light draft boats, are assigned to this duty. They have to use the upper reaches of the lighthouse inlet, which is very shallow and interspersed with mud flats. The gunboats begin to open fire on Fort Lamar in support of the Federals, but according to the men of the 3rd New Hampshire, the supporting fire proves little effect. By this time, Colonel Lamar, who has received a menee ball through the neck, is suffering from loss of blood, turns the command over to Lieutenant Colonel Gaylord, who, in turn when he is wounded in the knee, gives the command to Lieutenant Colonel Thomas W. Wagner. Once more, the Federal forces regroup and attempt a third assault. But by now, the Confederate reinforcements have made themselves felt, and the assault fails. After almost two and a half hours of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, Brigadier General Benham orders his men to begin a general retreat, both divisions return to their base camps. For such a short clash, the losses at the end of the battle of Secessionville are heavy. Union losses are reported at 685 men killed, wounded, or missing, while Confederates have lost 204 men in total. The Battle of Secessionville, also known as the First Battle of James Island, ends in a major victory for the Confederate defenders of Charleston. Due to the stubborn rebel defense at Fort Lamar, the Federals are repulsed in their only attempt during the war to attack Charleston via an overland route. With this promising Union avenue of attack now closed, the Confederates would continue to build up the defenses in the outskirts of Charleston. Now, Union commanders in South Carolina would begin making plans for a long, drawn-out siege of Charleston, one that would continue until the city's ultimate capture in the final months of the war.